Okay, today we're here with Cameron Bakery. Cameron, you are the Managing Director of Bakery Economics, and you were the former Chief Economist at ANZ New Zealand. So good catching up, Cameron. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's good to be out there in the sort of what we call the real private world now. It's exactly. A bit of a difference when you sort of manage your own shop as opposed to work for something else. Yeah, there's... You know, I was pretty independent and pretty vocal when I was working for ANZ, but you know, the word independence goes to a completely different level when you're out there working for yourself. And of course, when you're working for a financial institution, you don't need to say an awful lot about government or what's called fiscal policy. You're more concerned with monetary policy. You know, well, right. Obviously, one of the biggest games in towns now in New Zealand and around the globe is not just monetary policy, but it's what's going on within government and fiscal policy. And that's a theme that's going to permeate extend i think over the coming decade and you mentioned this is um this is a particular concern of yours these days as well right also meshed in obviously with increasing populism and um you know we we see this trend not only this division not only in new zealand we see it at the global level like, can you take us down a little bit like your thoughts on this yeah well as a as economists, we tend to focus a lot on the demand side of the equation. Right. And we think about through a monetary policy lens in regard to how we're going to realign demand and supply and get rid of inflation. It tends to be from the top down. Yeah, but the most important line for any economy is what's called the money line, which is the supply line, the productive capacity of your economy. And can you make those wheels turn a little bit faster? And, and government influence, government policy settings plays a pretty big influence in regards to that money line. You know, immigration settings, okay, how the regulation works within the financial system, you know, education, you know, the housing market, whether that's operating in a functional sense or not. And, and what I think we're starting to see globally is... You know, there's been a lot of damage done to the supply lines over the past few years. Yeah, What's sure. also going on is that the whole global environment is changing in regard to how we think about, yes, risk versus return, efficiency versus resilience, just in time becoming just in case. You know, trade in goods is becoming now trade in security. You know, globally, there's an awful lot more division. And division... Is, becomes very unhealthy both economically and socially. And it makes it really hard to chart a path going forward. And that just breeds uncertainty. And uncertainty is the antithesis of investing. And so we've got all these sort of things in the air at the moment that are leading to a whole lot more, I guess, uncertainty over you know, what's the supply side capacity of the global economy going forward? What are the trade-offs here? As we move into a, I think it's a fundamentally different environment. Yeah, efficiency was yeah the the normal economic paradigm. Trade liberalisation was very powerful for 10, 20, 30 years, but the world has changed. You know, words like risk, security, you know, are coming more and more into the language in regard to how we start to talk around the boardroom table, and, and there are trade offs here. You know, if you go for you know, security of supply, there's a cost to play for that on the other side. Yeah, so we just sort of, we're working through what that means, but in an economics, economist lens, when you break it down, it all goes back to what what's the supply side capacity of your economy to grow? How fast can you run? And I don't think it's that fast, or certainly not as fast as what we've been used to. And do you think, I mean, you are describing the trend of, okay, so we had these rules in place. Now vacuums are coming up. So it's more about power instead of just the rules, because now the incentives are that you can change the rules, which is, um, you know, is uh, normal in this more power-based environment. And, you know, if, we, if you think this tr like through, right, like from today, or let's say for the next, 10 years since we always have to invest we have to be in business and yes but like what does it mean like from a practical kind of standpoint 
you know, if I think about this now and I say, well, okay, yeah, I under understand. I have to navigate uncertainty, but like, how do I start navigating uncertainty? What is like, you know, a, a mental framework that I, that I have to kind of apply? When we, when you got a lot more uncertainty, there's, you can exercise what's called the, the time value of waiting until you get more clarity. The problem is you might not have clarity. Yeah, but if you step back and look at the past 10 to 20 years, you know, broadly speaking, we've had a global system where we've had a framework and it sort of worked. Yeah, not perfectly, but most of the issues we've had globally we've sort of managed to come to an end conclusion or we've sort of got there. The problem is now is that, I guess, on one level, the problems, the challenges are a lot more difficult. And the obvious one is climate change. Right. Yeah. How on yeah. earth do we get agreement on climate change and, and tell China, India, well, sorry, you do not have the right to industrialise, whereas the rest of the world has. Yeah, that's the playing field is is not level. And we're seeing the tectonic shift here, Russia versus Ukraine spill over into Europe, et cetera. But you start to worry about or think about yeah, you know, economic, financial, political institutions, whether they're going to stand the test of time. Yeah, you know, the World Trade Organization. The, the, these sort of things that have been designed, I guess, probably with the rear view mir mirror. You know, because they've been successful, are they really fit for purpose for what we need going forward? Because, and particularly when you go into a downturn, yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty simple economics. So right. when you go into a downturn, game theory comes into play, and game theory tells us the person's dilemma is that self interest tends to dominate group interest. And if you think about what we actually need globally, and it's once again simple game theory, and is that group interest will lead you to a superior outcome to self-interest. The problem is that what are the steps, the processes to actually get you into that self, and sorry, that group interest framework? And that the lessons of game theory is that if you play the game multiple, yeah, multiple times, you will eventually get there. Yeah, but there's politics at play here, and politics is colliding with populism. And, and populism drives self-interest, it drives division, it drives splintering. Do you see, let's, I mean, certainly in this kind of environment, you need to think like more strategically about things. And like, as you mentioned, self-interest, um, incentives. So now let's say we look at the top, they're obviously very, <clears throat> or like we know the incentives of players. I would say like, you know, you know, um, like more or less the incentives of, okay, um, China probably wants to do this. Um, you know, a New Zealand government or this kind of party wants to do this. Do you think like you can play it in a way? So in other words, I think what I'm saying is, do you see that like there are opportunities as well that you can play since you can, in, with a reasonable probability, kind of guess incentives or kind of can reason through incentives? Yeah, you, you can. If you take a real long-term lens, and I guess that this is one of the shortcomings of a model that's been rampant for the past 10, 20, 30. It's been what's called shareholder capitalism. Right. Yeah, it's it's rested in basic economics in regards of maximization of profits and yeah, using finite resources or or, or this sort of stuff. The problem is with capitalism is that it's manifest within a short time horizon. And we see this with the, the equity market in regards to how the market reacts if you miss a three-month earnings number, that sort of stuff. But you know, ultimately, it's the long game that matters. And what we now start to see is that people are starting to think a, a lot more about long-term mechanisms in regard to you know, how you look after your staff, sustainability of practices, you know, being connected into your community. Now, these are sort of things that you know, when you're sitting around the table, they're they're not going to deliver your immediate bang for your buck. But you're still going to undertake them because you, know, you want to be in business in 10 years. 
And the problem is the old sort of shareholder quite often is looking at the next three, six, 12 month numbers in regard to where you're going to be. And it's almost like there's a bit of a collision going on at the moment between what's called stakeholder capitalism, and that's the long game. Because we now live in a world where yeah, we can't complain to need to plunder our resources. We've gone from a world of abundance to a world of shortages. So we get a lot more smart about how we use things, but it's going head to head with what's called a shareholder capitalism. And yeah, we know that transition, that change is going to take place eventually, but those sort of transitions take time. And you're talking to a lot of people in New Zealand, not only investors, But, um, you know, people in, in agriculture, people in, in you know, different business associations, like, what do you think is on, like, these days, like, what, what are the big kind of trends or big waves that they have on their mind? You know, or the, like this long term thinking, like, what are the concerns and maybe like, how do they address them? Well, the concern, the biggest concern at the moment is not long term at all it's the top issues inflation the cost of living right and that's not just households it's it's businesses and in new zealand we've seen the tax tape uh, for corporate tax has now started to fall why because firms are being throttled like households from the cost line you know the revenue line looks okay but costs are explosive and they're denting the bottom line now, so suddenly corporate tax is falling 10% below where it was a year ago. And when company tax falls down, it's a pretty strong sign that firms are making less money or firms are making you know, negative money. So then the cost cutting starts and then you move into that next stage of the cycle. Beyond that, your firms are thinking, looking at a whole lot of lot of things. You have, New Zealand's an agricultural based economy. So how we transition to a decarbonized, environmentally friendly world, you know, taking account of our global climate change responsibilities without butchering the hell out of the agriculture sector, which is you know, three quarters of New Zealand's prior, uh, export of goods base is a big challenge. And New Zealand's very efficient in regard to how we produce food. Yeah, but we still are a net emitter within the agriculture sector. Yeah, it's so striking that right balance that yes, we need to change We need to have a lot more environmentally sustainable, friendly practices in place. We're going to get there, but you don't want to bludgeon the hell out of your key export sector along the way. And export of goods in New Zealand for the past five years has been flat. So we're already starting to see that coming through the real numbers, which is one of the reasons our current account deficit has blown out to eight and a half percent of GDP. And When, uh, you know, when, let's say we want to make an assessment, medium term assessment, like what data points are you looking at? Obviously, they are the, you know, the, the common leading indicators that like, you know, you can watch uh, for the New Zealand economy, but are there any kind of other data points that you find particularly interesting? Yeah, the, the big one at the moment, and it's not, Medium term, it's, it's long term. Okay. And yeah, I'm I'm a big believer that in the importance of it, an education system and a well functioning education system is a very big barometer of where an economy is going to be in 30 years' time. For sure. And if I have a look at New Zealand at the moment, that's probably one of my biggest concerns is that attendance and achievement, we've got a lot of problems. Yeah, so I can sort of break New Zealand down into, if I think about the short term, our biggest challenge, I think, is just inflation. Yeah, you move into the medium term and you start to think about sustainability, climate change, you know, being a globally responsible citizen, crime, law and order is a medium term issue. The current account deficit is a medium term issue. Um, the long term, in my mind, is a lot more centered around you know, education and you know, getting that system right because you know, the kids of today are the guardians. They're the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. You know, they're the guardians of New Zealand's economic future 
30 years down the track. And if we're not educating these kids properly today, then we're going to notice it, unfortunately, a long time down the track. And this is where you know, we're trying to rattle the cage a little bit in regard to getting the politicians a lot more focused or a lot more urgent about what we're seeing at the moment across the education sector in New Zealand. So what are we seeing? Well, what do you, you see, which is like really the biggest, the biggest problem? Well, it's a combination of, of problems. And, and you can't divorce what's going on with the education sector from other problems as well. So if you've got a, right. if you've got a dysfunctional housing market so that yeah, people don't have stability of abode, then odds are kids are not turning up to school. You know, if you've got problems in regard to a cost of living crisis where families can't feed kids, then odds are kids are not going to school, they're staying home. And maybe those year 12, 13 kids are going out to work to support the family as opposed to going to school. Right. But if you look at a lot of the stats, 50% of New Zealand kids regularly attend school. Now, regular attendance is what's called 90%, they're 90% of the time. So half of New Zealand kids are not attending school 90% of the time. Now, there's like 15% of kids are attending school you know, less than 70% of the time. And where we're seeing the biggest lack of attendance is in certain ethnic groups, Maori, Pacific Island kids, which the broad story there is that we do not live in a world of equality of opportunity. And the same sort of thing is around the globe, yeah, America at all. And what COVID has done is it's exposed yeah, that we've, be, we've become a lot more unequal in regard to you know, the lack of opportunity out there across certain groups. And, and that's a real problem. We've got to bring a lot of these kids up to the start line. And it's not about equality of outcomes, but you've got to get everybody in the same starting line so it's equality of opportunity. And that's a real challenge out there. I often, I often hear people that are sending their kids to school or... Um, also, like there's some interesting commentator across Europe regarding the quality of education, because we kind of seem to have moved away to a certain extent, at least from a more meritocratic based system where performance or competition was more encouraged to a system where it is discouraged. Do you see that as well? Or is it more really kind of the attendance and like, you know, finding the time and, and so on and so forth? It's attendance, it's achievement, it's, yeah. Now I think we've pushed things too much towards participation. Right. Yeah, we, we've actually played down winning success. You know, I think we've, and the desire to make everything a lot more safe, which is admirable, we've actually, the kids are not taking risk or learning about risk from a young age. So, so I'll give you an example. Yeah. So say a kid in a, play, in a playground in New Zealand falls out of a tree and they break it up. Well, yeah, when I was at school, the lesson was, well, be a little bit more careful when you climb up the tree. Now we will cut down the tree. Right. And, and all that does is uh, you know, you're not teaching kids about risk versus reward from a young age. You're not building these kids resilient. And one of my giving back things outside of my work life is what's called life education New Zealand, which is, yeah, we, we work with young kids. You know, we've got this distribution network of you know, trucks with big caravans and we've got this thing called Harold the Giraffe, but it's about teaching kids resilience and healthy outcomes and, and that sort of stuff. But, yeah, it's about getting the right balance. And at the moment, you know, I just think we don't have the right balance in regard to what's going on. And, yeah, naturally now when you don't have the right balance, you know, kids are leaving school and they're not as resilient as what they were 20 years ago. Mind yes. you, they've got a lot. They've got they've got a lot of different pressures as well. Yeah, we never had the pressures of the iPhone, Facebook, the Instagram, and the Snapchat, and all that social media stuff that the kids need to deal with today. And we were just getting out there riding our bikes. <laughs> do you do you see there's a correlation between 
this part of education that you have been just describing and populist politics or what you know like um more of a like left leaning kind of government yeah i guess it doesn't matter whether you look at education or you know i have a look at for for too long we've sort of we've had this separation between the economic and the social ledger and right. typically one side of the political lens will focus on the economy and another side will focus on the social ledger by spending a lot of money, debatable whether they deliver outcomes. But what we sort of need is that this mainstream political lot that realises the complex feedback loops between both the economic and the social ledger. Like you don't get the education sector right, your economy is going to burn in 20 years. You don't get the economy right, then people are not paying tax. If you're not paying tax, you can't register your money on the other side. And, and we've seen it here in New Zealand. Like yeah, pre this government coming in, yeah, the playing field was too heavily skewed towards landlords at the expense of renters. Mm -hmm. What we've seen in New Zealand is that we've screwed the scrum completely towards renters and we've taken it too far. And we sort of need to find that that halfway house. And I see that time and time again in regard to regulatory interventions. You go from one side of the political fence to the other, and you go from something too extreme to something equally extreme on the other side that just doesn't work. And this is where you it's a, it's, it's that middle ground. And I when I left you know, university, I worked at the New Zealand Treasury, and a politician at the time told me. The best policy option is normally about the third or fourth one that you guys at Treasury recommend, and I could never understand it. And then I clicked one day because number one and two was always that economically pure one. This is what the laws of economics tell us you need mm -hmm. to do, but it was not politically pragmatic. It was never going to stand the test of time, and what firms need is something that's pretty reasonable economically but it's going to stand the test of time beyond the election cycle. And this is where often the, the third or fourth best option, which is still reasonably economically pure, not perfect, but it's going to look beyond that election cycle. It gives those firms the stability, the certainty, yet yeah, we can deal with that. I mean, it, it seems to be a larger trend that we there's a, there's a shift from a big picture perspective, from capital to labor, right? You see this, um, I think, especially in the in the Western world. Like um, when you describe this, I, are there any kind of you know good examples where you see? Well, you know, I see the benefits. There might be opportunities. That's how, as an investor, I might be able to take advantage of it. Well, what, what, what's gone on for 30 years is that there's a general principle, labour's share of GDP, but most economies has gone down and capital share has gone up. And it's almost like we're, we've been at peak profits. And what we're now starting to see is the blowback on right. the other side because suddenly labour, we've realised, is suddenly scarce. You know, population aging, shifting attitudes to work versus leisure, labour force participation. There's a there's a whole lot of things that are going on, but suddenly we've got an acute shortage of workers around the globe, and suddenly 3.5 percent unemployment is the new normal across a lot of countries in the Western world. And I see Australia just came out today with a with a 3.5 percent number, and you know, basically unchanged. Yeah, you know, the opportunities out of that is that look ultimately firms are going to pull the lever pretty heavily on technology, technological driven advancement in regard to replacement. And, and we're starting to see that in countries that, I guess, pay the higher wages because the higher wages mean that the marginal cost or opportunity in regard to investment on the other side, sure. you get payback a lot quicker. Whereas in those low wage economies such as New Zealand, you're not quite at that, that barrier yet where you're going to flip the switch on a lot of that substitution. But that substitution's around the corner. And on some levels, you can you point to some of this in regard to maybe that's why some of the equity 
you know, market activity might be validated on some levels because people are looking at AI, et cetera, in regard to that substitution, in regard to what is going to take place. But there's still a bit of a bun fight going on within the workforce at the moment, and we're seeing it through industrial, industrial action. And that industrial action is going to continue, and it's always amuses me when the was it the Hollywood script writers when they were out on strike, was it? Was yeah, it the, yeah. One, the other day. Yeah. <laughs> Best time in 30 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, uh, suitable with the AI bubble trend. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's also like there's an election coming up. And um, I think like it is fair to say that politics has been playing a quite important role and uh, populist politics in New Zealand. Like any thoughts on like, you know, where we are heading? I think we're going to see a change, and I I don't see that say that lightly because, yeah, she's been a pretty close race in regard to the polls over the last twelve months, but I think we're now starting to see a lot more evidence that New Zealand just wants change. I guess the question mark is what are the credentials of the other side of the political fence to really do what is necessary and yeah the, the economics are going to be pretty clear in regard to what we need to do but of course pre-election or post-election we are still going to be in a pretty divided New Zealand and yeah, one political party plus a few add-ons are going to get a mandate but it's likely to be a small mandate yeah, so the vision is still going to be there but we will see a change in economic direction on some levels but yeah there's a fair bit of healing both economically and socially to take place across New Zealand and I'm not seeing anything really bold at present now there's a, a substitute policy but it's not what you would call really reformist It's interesting because you just mentioned when you mentioned the okay high uh you know high wage um kind of countries as you know new zealand when like um, companies have the the incentive to move out or to substitute with technology um i was just thinking well you know do you see that governments because that's another trend are stepping in and subsidizing you know, technologies and businesses, like there's the famous case in Germany for the 10 billion uh, Intel factory, um, where pretty much it's, a, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't know, like, I think it's 10 million or so as a per worker that is um, going to be working there. Um, so do you see like any of these policies? So is it a self kind of healing where we are going a little bit more towards economic policies that are reasonable or are we kind of you know is it more like a spiral so now we have to fix it uh but like fixing it means maybe in in you know making it worse to a certain extent what's well, it's a fine line right so if the, there's multiple levels of support that the government is looking at and you know, the government today just gave 90 million dollars to Fonterra which is a big dairy exporter, right. to try to substitute out you know, coal, et cetera, from some of its factories. So they're getting a subsidy to help with decarbonisation, that sort of stuff. And yeah, what's called you know, New Zealand Steel, the big steel mall, they, they got that yeah, pretty big check. So governments globally and in New Zealand are starting to front foot and encourage these firms to do it. Now we can, yeah, you know, you can debate would that sort of stuff take place anyway? And I guess it's a moot point. The companies would say no. I suspect they would have done it eventually. Yeah, so all the government checkbook does is sort of accelerate a little bit further along the path in regard to where it sits. But if I go back to yeah, sort of what I said earlier on about your trade is now taking on security characterizations. And it's security and food, energy and technology. And yeah, what we're seeing globally is that the checkbook's being opened 
to actually drive you know, that alteration of supply chain to get a little bit more dependence into the supply chain because the world is becoming increasingly separate. And yeah, that, that's likely to, to continue going forward. And if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is to be very wary about relying on that just-in-time model because just-in-time is not always just-in-time and you need to plan for just-in-case. Right. So lo and behold, the manufacturing sectors globally are getting a little bit more of a of a localised push in regard to near-shoring, onshoring, close-shoring. My favourite one is friend-shoring. <laughs> in regard to where, where, you, where you're putting stuff. Yeah, but get pretty big tectonic shifts compared to the environment we've been used to. Yeah, we've been used to efficiency just in time. Yeah, trade yeah, through economic, the laws of comparative advantage. Yeah, Rules-based orthodoxy in regard to what goes on. And th th those are not the maximum we're operating with going forward. And it's fine to shift to a new model, but there's going to be costs from that model. And I guess one of the big costs is that that does not look like a disinflationary world to me. It looks like a world with a bit more inflation than what we've been used to, which means a bit higher interest rates than what we've been used to. So, so there's no free lunch here when you start to overlay those geopolitical concerns or differences on the wider macroeconomic picture. I mean, the interesting thing about friend shoring is, I guess, that you can still have the just-in-time model to a certain extent. I think like um, for the just-in-case model, uh, it's much more difficult because what is just-in-case ends, right? Like, so you have, okay, you have semiconductors, but what is national security end? Well, now you have dual-use goods, and now you're moving to next industry, and then you see, wow, the umbrella <laughs> of what is, you know, related to national security is now quite wide and uh, pretty much just in case uh, applies to everything. Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, Australia is our closest friend and I'm trying to sort of work out what we could be friend shoring with Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ke Cameron, before we um, wrap up, like where can people, apart from Cassandra, Follow your work. Well, the, the stuff that I do is very tailored. Yeah, I'm not a, I don't put out generic research because there's, there's more than enough of that stuff on New Zealand from the various bank economists. You right. know, the stuff I do is exclusive. It's specific. You know, I don't believe in repeating what everybody else is putting out there. You know, probably where I'm a little bit different to the others is that I'm thinking a lot more through a supply lens as opposed to demand. I'm thinking a lot more through the geopolitical lens in regard to where we're going to be, what that means for the broader macroeconomic stuff. And I tend to think a lot more about economic indicators such as the current account within a five-year lens as opposed to the business confidence, which has got a lifeline of about a month. So my, my stuff is very personalised. So people are far better to get in contact directly in regards to what I can provide. Fantastic. Karen, great to have you on. Great discussion. Take Thank care. you so much.